Welcome back to the Surf Mastery Podcast. I got one housekeeping item that is the the first Surf Mastery coaching trip is happening on May 18th till the 24th in El Salvador at Puro Surf, which is a coaching resort. Um, those that are keen to attend this trip, please, there are two spots left for more details and to book. Email me, Mike at surfmastery.com Today's guest is 1988 world champion surfer Barton Lynch. If you want to find out more about Barton or you might even be inspired to use him as a coach or send your groms to one of his uh, coaching trips then you can check out bartonlynch.com that's B-A-R-T-O-N-L-Y-N-C-H dot com So how was Margs? Oh, Margaret's was, uh, I mean, it's, it really is just one of the most beautiful places in the world and somewhere I just love going. But, uh, you know, we had some good surfs and some great times over there until it sort of all unraveled with some shark attacks and, and sort of put fear through everybody. Uh, and there, there was there were sharks everywhere, you know. It was a real, the ocean was alive and everyone was thinking about it and talking about it and it was so top of mind that I don't know anyone that surfed after the shark attacks, you know. Yeah, that's heavy, huh? Yeah, kept everyone out of the water after that and and just because there was, it just seemed that there were so many of them around and I suppose the beaching of 130 pilot whales a couple of weeks before it, just down a couple of hours down the coast, had put a massive slick, you know, and there were 130 of them. Um, and they, they saved 20 that then rebeached themselves. So, you know, that, that, that seeping through the sand and into the ocean had really brought a lot of, a lot of creatures around. And then uh, one had beached itself at left-handers as well, just, you know, half an hour up the coast or less um, from Margaret. So it was sort of either side of the event. And, um, and both those shark attacks happened, you know, within... A few hundred meters of each other, really, five hundred meters of each other, or whatever. There at Gracetown, and and at that point, the second one, the, the after the first one, they ran the contest again. They, you know, they they called it off for a little while and then started the contest again. But then once that second attack happened, um, that was just too much and too much of a risk for anything to keep going. You know, so really, that guy was the guy that blew it for everyone. You know, he, he if he hadn't he'd gone out in the water. Apparently, the word in the street was that they had the, the um, life the boat the, the lifeguards or the, the the patrol boat was there yelling at him to go get out of the water over their loudspeaker because they had a great white around their boat, and the guy and the guy sitting there no the waves are perfect no one's out here I don't you know whatever it was and and ignored the advice and ended up getting hit which consequently saw the event be cancelled and, and just, you know, created a whole furor. So if that idiot, for want of a better description, had stayed out of the water like everyone else had and had been told to um, and that second attack hadn't happened, well, then we may have seen the event finish. Yeah. Uh, surfers are the worst. <laughs> Especially that guy, was he wasn't even from the area and, and you know, the word in the street was that he wasn't going to be allowed back in the area after that too. Yeah. It, the, um, the whales, is, is that an unusual event to have that many whales around? I think it is that many, but I, I think the beachings are something that have gone on forever. Um, and I don't know that anyone knows why it happens. Um, but it, it, it's not unusual. It is something that happens, uh, but that many... That's the most that I've ever heard of. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, were you over there at Marg's on a coaching capacity? I was over there for Hurley um, and the Hurley Surf Club activation that was a part of the Margaret River event. Uh, and we were what we really do with that activation is, um, is coach people, coach kids primarily. We had kids from the Margaret River High School and from the Quorum Up Board Riders and uh, come in, you know, come visit the surf club area and we would take them surfing and video them and, and then they would come in and we'd review the video and go through the coaching with them. 
and then at the same time they would hang out and spend the day at the event with us and, and watch the heats and, and learn that way as well. Uh, and then we, we did a, another day with Surfing Western Australia where they brought their top 35 uh, junior surfers in the state of Western Australia down to the event. And uh, at Smith's Beach at Yelling Up, we did a coaching day with them there. And, and that was really successful. So, yeah, in a coaching capacity, um, not with, with pro surfers, but, you know, through the Hurley Surf Club. Is it, mostly, is it mostly grommets that are sort of taking Hurley up on this initiative? Um, yeah, I would say primarily uh, grommets. But, again, there are quite a few um, older, older people, you know, working, working individuals who just want to surf better. We did have a, a video analysis component to the whole project in the initial stages. And, and I think, you know, in the, the majority, I'd say 60% of the people I did video coaching for were kids and the other 40% were, you know, people in their, you know, I suppose late 20s to, to late 40s in that range, you know, which is kind of the, I suppose, largest sort of surfing demographic. And um, so, yeah, I think most people, I mean... You know, people, when you talk about coaching, people kind of get, uh, some people aren't interested, some people think it's a, a wank or whatever, but at the same time, we, you know, the Hurley Surf Club motto really is it's all about having fun and that really the better you surf, the more fun you're going to have. And that's been my experience. Yeah. And I think that'd be your experience too, you know, Michael, the more, the better you surf, the more fun you end up having, so... That's the premise. It's not all about being professional surfers or competitive surfers. It's really just about improving your performance so you can sort of get more fun out of it. Yeah, well, it's not just about improving your performance. It's about improving your skill level and your confidence so you can do, you know, you can surf bigger and and more, you know, solid waves and hollower waves. Yeah, more challenging waves, that's right. And, and I suppose the more you can push yourself um, the more you push yourself, the more you grow, and it has that impact on your whole life rather than just your surfing life. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's, I've always wondered, though, why it's so underutilised as far as, like, as an adult group. Because if you go to a golf course, the demographic, the demographic is the opposite. It's mostly middle-aged adults and then some grommets. Yeah, I, I, I think that... What you have there really is, is, is golf as a sport, started as a sport and, and lives and dies as a sport, like tennis, like football. But surfing, I suppose, is more of a culture. And it has, it has you know, the majority of surfers will never compete in their lives. And if you think about surfing culturally, um, <laughs> It has an anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian background. It's kind of in that counterculture. It's against the mainstream. It's something that, that is on the other side of the fence and, and, and that, that still exists in surfing. And I think when you, even if you take it through to the professional level, the, the surfers at the professional level that have the, the most support from the public are the ones that still embody the culture more than they do the sport. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at, say, women's surfing, you look at Stephanie Gilmore, the reason, you know, she's obviously incredible, but she sort of embodies the culture of surfing. She is not looked at so much as an athlete that trains for this sport. She's looked at a surfer who competes in this sport, and John John Florence would be the same. He's not someone that, that talks about his training, talks about the sport, talks about winning and losing so much. He's more... Uh, you know, although he's a competitive surfer and a world champion, he's more sort of culturally respected. And I think that that, that is the important thing. I mean, if you look on the men's side, you look at, say, Gabriel Medina, who's looked at as a competitor and a competitive mongrel, mongrel at that. Um, you know, people look at, um, at Gabriel and, and his public support is not what it, what it is or John John's is, and it's because of those that cultural appeal that you have, and so there is still a a bit of negativity around surfing competitions and that whole side of the sport being a part of the culture, and a lot of people just don't buy it. They don't think it has a place in surfing, and that surfing's about between you and the ocean has nothing to do with a competitive drive or a competitive thing. So I think it's those cultural influences that 
that have that impact on people. Yeah, yeah. No, I always, but I always sort of say to people, you know what, if you get, don't get surf coaching because you want to compete, get it because you want to, you, you want to go on a trip to, you know, Uluwatu or, you know, somewhere, somewhere yeah. heavy, somewhere where you need, where you need to be sharp and, and onto it. Um, and also uh, another aspect is like, you can you can really learn to surf small waves on on quite a different level yeah. with a bit of coaching. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, you and I have had that experience working together on 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 your surfing, and I think that you know, it's, to me, it's it is all about having improving your performance so you're getting more out of it. And but again, there's that you know, when I was a kid, I remember you know, contests were taboo. Uh, people didn't like them. Colourful wetsuits were out. You just had to wear black. Um, if you if you walk down the beach, I used to walk down the beach with two and three surfboards to try out, you know, and to work with, and people would laugh at that. I remember stretching on the beach, and no one would stretch. Stretching wasn't something that you ever saw anyone do. So we definitely have moved, you know, in, in terms of the amount of people taking coaching, that's improved and increased dramatically, and of all ages, I would say, and, and all genders. And then when it comes to, you know, the, the act, like you see a lot of people stretch now before they go in the water. Everyone kind of, a lot of people understand the benefits of that and, and the, the, the effect of that in avoiding injury and all that sort of thing. So we're definitely heading in that direction, but compared to other sports, we're still a long way, way back in, in, in the, the culture more, rather than the sport. Like you said, we did some work together and, and one of the things I really liked about your coaching style was it, it wasn't, a, a lot of coaches I've had in the past have been very technique based and it's all been technique. And, but one of the drills you gave me was probably one of the best things for me learning how to surf small waves. Uh, would you be willing to share that drill? Yeah, which one was that? So the the ten wave drill. Oh, the the waves as fast as you can drill. Exactly. So simple, but yeah, super simple, but super effective. I'll let you explain it, and then I'll sort of give listeners my experience and what I gained out of it. Okay. I, I originally that that drill was originally given to me by Peter Druin, who was the gentleman who created the very first man on man surfing events. Came up with that. You know, people used to surf in six man heats, and he came up with the idea of man on man. And they had the first Stubbies Man on Man event in 1977, and um, and I thought, well, he'd be a, an interesting guy to have do some to do some coaching with, having thought of it, and obviously was a creative mind. And he gave me the waves as fast as you can drill to do myself, and I just I found it super beneficial. Uh, you know, to go into it in a little detail, the idea is that you've you've got to abandon wave selection completely. You actually just go at a like a rabid dog on the hunt for waves you paddle with intensity you search for waves with intensity and anything you can catch you do catch regardless of its quality um, and then try to make the very most out of it and it, it gets you surfing waves that you would ordinarily not surf um, and has you riding the worst waves that are in the lineup at that time most of the time but it has the impact or the effect of really sharpening your reflexes and and turning you turning you into a ninja, you know, getting that really fast twitch fibre going, and and it expands what you think is possible and what you you believe you're able to ride, and then when you go back to selecting waves, and taking your time and selecting waves, uh, you you you're able to get much more out of the performance on that wave. Um, it also has a sort of meditative or psychological effect where with the counting of the waves that you catch and the breathing that you're doing while you're doing the drill and trying to keep that focus and control of your mind while your body is being physically taxed um, is, is very beneficial and I think it, it just that that raising of the level of intensity in your performance is a really positive thing as well yeah well well put um I don't have anything to add to that because the the way you described it is exactly my experience. It's it's something I just urge everyone to try. Um, it's kind of sounds when I when you first said it to me, I thought, oh what? Like what's the point of that? Mm. 
catch and then once I had done it and then I think I remember the first time we did it it was I think I most I think two of the waves that I caught were probably only knee high and I was on a short board and I thought no way I'm even going to be able to catch these let alone surf them but I ended up actually doing two catching two waves and really surprising myself and probably rode the smallest waves to the best of my ability just within those 10 waves like ever like mm. just because I was literally forced to do it <laughs> and you just you find a way you could have it's, it is probably the best out of all the technique and different boards and I, the, this is definitely the best drill that improved my small wave performance or to put it another way improved my ability to surf small waves and therefore have more fun when the waves are small yeah exactly exactly and 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 once you you know the idea there is i used to and as i told you when we did it i used to do 50 waves as fast as i could and the idea was to have that 50th wave have that same intensity and that same energy same focus as the very first one and um, when you could do that and you were going at that level of intensity, paddling as fast as you can, kicking the feet, paddling you know, in a frenzy, hunting for waves up and down the beach, always moving, never sitting and constantly uh, uh, you know, searching for opportunity, you found opportunity where you didn't even see that it was. And then you know, as a competitor, it really gave me confidence when the waves were small and as the waves would start to deteriorate and most other of my my opponents wanted the, didn't want to surf or started to go into negative states of mind. I was excited, mate. I wanted it to actually get worse because I knew that I'd practiced in the very worst of conditions. And even on, on better surf days, I'd been catching the worst waves on offer on those days as well. And so it really sharpened my small wave performance to a level that, you know, it had, it had most probably never been. And I don't think I would have been as good in, in small waves as I became because of that drill. And then I think the, you know, like swimming laps in a pool is always a good example. Your mind tends to wander because you've got all this time and you're swimming up the, the, the length of the pool and you're thinking to yourself, well, this is lap number seven, the next lap will be eight, then I'm halfway to 16, and then, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden you go, what am I on now? Am I on seven or eight? And your mind, through its wandering, would lose its focus of what, what lap you're actually swimming I think a lot of people have had that experience and it's the same counting the waves you know when you were doing say it's you'd say you're doing 30 as fast as you can and you know you'd be on 15 and you'd think I'm halfway there the next one's 16 and your mind wanders off and then all of a sudden you're confused and you've lost count and that discipline that you can bring to the drill and to your mind by keeping count and not allowing your mind to wander and when you're on the 12th wave disciplining it and and you sense it's it's desire to wander and it's desire to go and start counting ahead of itself and getting ahead of itself but you discipline the mind to just stay right where it was and and it really brought about an awareness of where your mind was going and wandering and thinking when you were surfing and then through that awareness you were able to control your mind for me in competitive situations and actually keep the mind focused and disciplined on where you needed it to be rather than having it wander as a competitor would might wander onto the scores you might be getting the waves your opponents had winning and losing and all of those Um, emotional components of success or failure and and all of a sudden you're not even thinking about what you're doing so um, it also had that psychological advantages I think that it brought and then the physical advantages um, in fitness and strength as well because I think you know when we did I remember you coming in looking pretty puffed and going well that was that was actually hard work oh yeah yeah definitely so it's you've got the physical advantages in, in terms of fitness you've got the mental you know advantages in terms of awareness and disciplining your mind and then you've got the surfing advantages of of that that come through increasing that intensity that you've got in the drill and really going at it hard and surfing the waves really hard and 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 it it improves your surfing that way as well so it's it's super well rounded and as you said it's so basic and so simple but the better you get at it the more you do it the more you realize that there's not it's not that basic, actually. Um, and I think that's one of those, those amazing things. It's like meditation where you go, well, what, you just sit there and breathe. That's pretty simple and basic. But what comes out of that 
is so deep and profound. So, you know, life tends to be like that, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Um, another, another coaching tool that you used with me was, was one of the street boards. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose from a technique point of view, as you said, the majority of coaching that is done, and I would say it's most probably 90% of the coaching that's done is, is in and around technique and where your body is and what you're doing with your body. Um, which is important, and, and there's a textbook in and around technique that, that is pretty standardised now and, and, and does work and does bring results, but at the same time, if everyone surfs to the textbook, then we lose that individuality and that personality that is so important in surfing. So too much focus on technique, in my opinion, can be a problem because you do lose that individuality. Um, but the street boards... They are the best tool that I've had for working on technique because you can get repetition on the land. And the street boards are, a, a, there's a few models in their range. The, the primary one that we've been using is the big board, which is kind of, it's like a snowboard length. So you're literally standing in your surf stance. It's got the pump up tyres that you can, you know, make harder or softer depending on the terrain that you're riding. And then the way they ride in a rail-to-rail fashion is that it's exactly the same as surfing. Um, and so I, that's my favourite tool for working on, on, on technique. The first thing I do with people is put them on that board um, on the, in the car park at the beach and I see what they're doing on that board and it shortcuts my analysis of their surfing in the water because without the street board, I may see something from the person I'm working in And then you wait 10 minutes or five minutes for him to get another wave and it might be a different style of wave and you don't see the same thing again. You've got to wait for a similar moment on a wave to see the same thing. And so it can be, it can take you an hour to analyse someone's performance in the water where on the street board, they have a couple of runs on that and you see it there and you can literally start to tinker with things a little bit, work with the muscle memory, get that muscle memory to understand what you want it to do in the water through the repetition that you get on land. And then when you're on the wave, um, if you've done enough repetition and you add a bit of awareness to it, then the body, in theory, will follow through and make make those changes without you having to be so conscious and deliberate with it. Because we all know when you get up on a wave, most of the time you forget what you're doing anyway. (laughs) <laughs> and you, you get to, because you're so absorbed in the moment, um, and you get to the end of the wave and you go, oh, I was meant to throw my arm this way, I forgot all about it, okay, next wave I'm going to do that. And so it can be a real laborious process, m- making change to technique in the water, but on the land it can be um, a lot quicker and easier. But the street board itself is a big, sort of bulky board, and it's great for, for us adults, but and it's my favourite board to ride, but for kids... Um, they can be too big and hard to ride, and we've got a smaller version called the Dragon. But in recent times, there's been a, a style of board come to the market with that swiveling front truck, and I suppose Carver and Smooth Star are two examples of that swiveling tr- front truck. Um, and we've had, I've had a lot of kids, I know that lots and lots of kids ride those boards, but the problem with that swiveling front truck is that it creates a habit of moving to your front foot to build speed. Because on those boards, through a sort of wiggling almost of the front foot, you create speed. Once the speed's generated, then you can start to go into your turns. Um, And so the problem with that is, is that for us in small waves as surfers on a surfboard, you want to stay on your back foot and drive your board through flatter sections and in smaller waves using your fins. The fins are there to drive the board to build speed. And so if the habit you've created out of the board you're riding on land is to go to the front foot to create speed, um, you've got that that habit in the water. And I've had to work with many a surfer who have grown up surfing on those type or or skateboarding on those type of boards or or practising for their surfing on those type of boards. And it can be a real problem. So that, that's the board that we've now designed and that we're releasing with street boards is called the Switch. And it's a, a smaller style board for kids, a penny style size board, a little bit bigger than the penny skateboards. And the benefit of this thing is it's got three modes, more or less. It, it can be ridden as a normal skateboard. Um, 
and and then with the switch with the moving of a switch you can turn it into a caster or, or a moving front truck but we've been super conscious in the way we've designed that front truck and it doesn't it doesn't allow you to wiggle it still has a rail to rail effect and so we feel like we've cracked the code in terms of, of that type of surf training or surf simulating skateboard and it's the best one that I've ridden and all of the coaches that we've shared it with to date have all said that this is you know that it's the one and if, if you're a kid and you want to train for your surfing on land I think the switch which we launched today um, is is one of the best boards I've ever seen and it's it's for kids it's the perfect sort of supplement to their surfing yeah it's a really unique design that front truck um, I'm I, I mean, it's you say it's for kids, but I'm I'm looking forward to getting one. Yeah, I mean that's and that's the other side of the coin. I mean, I like the I like the big street board because you're literally in your surf stance, and I feel like that's a really important part of that surf simulation. Um, on a normal skateboard or or, or a, a smaller skateboard deck, it's kind of a um, you know the the stance is narrowed, so it's not exactly the same stance, but it's still the same movements, the same upper body movements, and the same technique. That you need so it's 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 something that we're super stoked about we've also got another board that we're working on uh, that we've got in the in the design phase r d phase where the front trucks and the back trucks are going to move together so rather than just the front truck doing a, a, that type of movement we're kind of working on something that's another step beyond this as well so we've got a lot of lot of projects in the in the in the uh, R and D stage, but this one, without question, the switch is something that that I, we think is is going to really change, you know, surf simulation for a lot of kids and get them out of that front foot wiggling habit that some of those other boards create. And then the third part of it, the third component of that young that board, is the brake, and it comes with a brake that you can take off or leave on, and that brake allows you to go down. Pff, big hills and actually be in control of your speed with that brake and it's it's you use it in the backhand so it's a, a third point of contact with the board you got your two feet and then that backhand on the brake and you can use use it as a third point of contact control your speed and then the thing that we like the most you would have seen you go down to any skate park and the amount of young kids riding scooters is is astonishing and most young kids get a scooter before they get a skateboard and a lot of kids are staying on scooters and not even going to skateboards or surfboards so our mission is to get more kids onto surfboards and onto board sports in general whether that's surfing snowboarding or skateboarding and the brake allows you to stop the board stand on it have it perfectly still and then release the brake and start to roll, put the brake back on. And for beginners learning to skateboard, like the handle does on a scooter, it gives them that, that, that confidence. The brake can give young kids that confidence in learning to skateboard earlier than, than they do now. And then that way we, we, we hope to see more kids coming into surfing and into snowboarding and into the board sports as a byproduct of having that break and that that sort of user friendly th- situation with the break for younger kids. Yeah, oh, what a great idea. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. And it's a Kickstarter campaign, so it's going to launch in, on Kickstarter in, in the next couple of days. So I'll send you, Michael, a video that we've got on the product and then the Kickstarter link, and perhaps we can put that up for people so that they can get their hands on it. Um, the other great part of it is the price. Uh, at the first 250 are at $99 and then through the Kickstarter campaign they're going to be available at $115 and most other surf simulator training type skateboards are $300 plus so at, a, at $115 it's a deal as well so there's a lot of a lot of pluses a lot of upside to the switch model that we're, we're releasing. Yeah, it sounds like a great product. I'm looking forward to trying it. Yeah, we'll get you one over there. We're going to get you one over there. We'll send it over to you. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate that. Cool. So that's, um, I'll, I'll put links to all to that video and to the Kickstarter campaign in the show notes to this episode, um, which you can just see on, on the app, on the podcast app on your iPhone, or you can go to surfmastery.com and see it there as well. Um, the website for the boards themselves is streetboards with a Z dot net. And if you're really serious, the the, the larger board, I agree, but like that larger board with the big blow up wheels where you can have a proper stance length is 
it's probably the only skateboard I've ever tried where you can you can just get hard on your rail. You can put that the angle of the board at forty five degrees, and because the the way it's designed, there's no wheel bite. It's just you can just dig your rail in as if you were surfing a decent wave. Exactly, and hold the rail through the turns. And, and the good thing about that style of board is that you can't, for your surfing, it doesn't let you ride it wrong. It fixes those technique issues that you have just by riding it. And, um, and so, it's, yeah, I, I find that you, know, you combine that with that in-water practice and you've got the perfect, the perfect balance. And, and you know, that's what makes surfing so hard is that, that we can't get repetition Every wave you ride's different. Every day you go surf's different, and you just don't get the repetition that you can in some of those other more pedestrian type sports. So, the the, the surf simulators and being able to practice it on land is 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 one of the keys, along with visualization. I think if you you throw in some visualization, you ride the street boards on the land, and then you you get your practice in the water. You're going to accelerate your learning curve dramatically. You know. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I I use surf style skateboarding all the time, so I'm a big believer. All right, Barson. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, mate. And happy to happy to catch up again, Michael, and talk in a little more detail about some of the other drills and some of the other experiences I have in and around the sport and the coaching of it. Yeah. All right. So yeah, part. Stay tuned for part two, listeners. <laughs> Barton will be back. All, all right. right. Thank you, Barton. Thank you, Michael. So I just wanted to reiterate that small wave drill that Button described. It's you got to try it, and if you have a surf coach, uh, share this episode with your surf coach, and and you know they can do their own interpretation of this drill. It's it, it is one of the best things that has helped my small wave surfing. So yeah, go ahead and check out streetboards.net. That's streetboards with a Z or a Z. Dot net and of course their kickstarter campaign which is a super affordable surf style skateboard that they've made product looks awesome and it's so well priced so please just go, go and support them have it have a closer look and as button and i mentioned they've also got a you know a, a more serious product with the the the, the full-sized skateboard with the big rubber wheels that is a phenomenal surf style skateboard as well i use it with clients um, and i use it myself all the time the up and coming trip and there will be more um i know it's a bit short notice on this one 18th to the 24th of may in south america in el salvador at puro surf you can check out more from them at p-u-r-o-s-u-r-f purosurf.com you check out their resort. It looks pretty awesome. Looking forward to it. And what's going to be happening here, uh, myself and Barry Green are going to be the primary surf coaches down there. Um, there's going to be video analysis, in-water coaching. There's going to be, uh, I'll be doing like movement and mobility and body weight strength classes as well as some of the performance neurology stuff I've been doing. Uh, so vision training, balance training, um, flow training, just to be sharp and onto it. Uh, we'll be doing, we'll also be doing um, small seminars on you know, equipment, surfing, surf technique in general, answering all and any questions that the clients have. Uh, Barry and myself bring a broad range of skills to the uh, to the table, and we really it's going to be a small group. So, sort of just generalizing here because it's going to be tailored to what each client wants, um, both as individuals and as a group. And there are more details on Barry and myself's bios on our websites. Uh, me at surfmastery.com and Barry at makingthedrop.com. Thanks for tuning in to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Frampton. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with the latest interviews. Please share with your friends. Check us out uh, on Facebook at uh, Surf Mastery Surf. And if you're on iTunes, please go and give us a little rating. That'd be awesome. Until next time, keep surfing. <laughs>